Welcome back to Ask the PM Pros. And today we have uh, Tim Dalhouse and Ian Fisher in your virtual PMO. And uh, we're going to talk about something that, that kicks people's butts on the PMP exam called earn value management, right? And uh, so I'm going to kick it over to Ian. He's going to bring something up and, and we're going to get this discussion started about this really, really tough topic. So, so what we have here is the ta uh, table 7-1 from the PMBOK, it's, uh, page 267 for those of you on the home version. Uh, and you can just open that up and you can see there's there's a ton of different formulas in there to talk about essentially taking a look at the, the financial and schedule metrics from a dollar value standpoint uh, in project management. Yeah, yeah. So the project manager body of knowledge makes this look a little bit daunting, doesn't it? If you were just look at this, uh, um, this page out of the pin box and say, man, I got to answer questions about that. That's what's scary to most people, right? So we yeah. want to break it down a little bit uh, today. And I think we're just going to talk about one area of that, right? Because we, if we try to talk about this whole EVM topic. We're going to be here for a couple hours. <laughs> oh, yeah. so, so we want to break it down to one thing today called uh, estimate at completion, right? Or EAC. Yep. And so, so the way that estimate at completion works, uh, there's actually, if you look on here, there's, there's four different formulas that you can actually use uh, to, to find out what your estimate at completion is. And the simplistic way to say that is, what's my new budget based upon the work that's been done so far in the project, right? That's what the estimate of completion is. It's the original budget, the budget of completion, that's what I'm starting with. That's my baseline, that's my beginning. But as work goes through on the project due to you know, changes, due to getting ahead or behind schedule based on the rate of work, what's my new budget? How much, how much money do I need to actually do this project? Um, so, right. So, I'm sorry. So, so if you were like 50% through with your project and you'd already spent 70% of your money, right, you're obviously over budget. And so if you, at that point, 50% of the project, you, you wanted to figure out, okay, I've spent 70% of the money. How much is the total cost of the project going to be now? Because obviously it's going to be more than we originally thought, right? So exactly. when you figure that number out, that's called estimate at completion. So if you're over budget, your EAC is obviously going to be higher than your original cost, right? Which was called budget at completion. And if you're if you're currently under budget halfway through your project, the, the opposite will be true. That your estimate at completion would be less than your original budget at completion. Absolutely. And that's why it's important to track. You know, one of the things that uh, a lot of businesses are wondering is how much money am I spending on these projects? Where's the money actually going? Uh, mm -hmm. And, you know, you, you told me at the beginning it was going to cost this much. How much is it going to be costing me now based upon how much things are, 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 are changed or the, what's been going on so far in the project? So there's four, there's four actual formulas that you can actually use to, to do this. And I'm going to pull them up here for you one by one and just explain to you how they work. All right? It's very simple. So your first formula, this is the one that's most commonly used. It's at the top of the list in the PMBOK. And it's the EAC equals the budget of completion divided by your cost performance index. In other words, how you've been performing in terms of money so far. So the, the amount of value that you're returning for your, for your dollars spent in the project, assuming that that remains constant throughout the rest of the project, this is what your estimate of completion would be. This would be what your new budget would be. So and as, as you said, Tim, in this scenario, if, if I'm currently ahead, if I'm doing really well, then my estimated completion should be lower than my budget of completion. But if I'm not doing so good, or maybe I'm way over uh, my budget calculations, initial budget calculations, then my estimated completion obviously is going to be much higher than I originally planned. Yeah, so that CPI, got cost performance index, that represents your current spending performance, yeah. right? So you're taking your original budget, the BAC, and dividing it by the current spending performance. And that's what gives you what we think the project's going to cost now. Absolutely. Good. And that's actually the easiest way to calculate estimate of completion. It's one of the most common ways because people just make the assumption, okay, well, this is the way that we've been going on a project and things are probably going to remain the same. Right, right. Then, there's some, then there's some other ones, some, some not so often used ones, but there's purposes for each one of them. Right? So the second one is, Estimated completion equals the actual cost, the amount of money that I've spent so far on the project, plus my original budget, minus the value that I've earned so far in the project. So this basically says, hey, something happened. Either I spent too much money on something, I had an un unplanned or unpredicted uh, uh, expenditure, and now I need to know, based upon that anomaly, what's next? 
What's my what's my budget look like now? So I uh, think things like my, my supplier went bankrupt and I had to switch suppliers or there was forest fires that jacked up the price of lumber and now my lumber cost you know more than I anticipated originally. So that one anomaly is isolated. It's by itself. It's not uh, a common trend throughout all of your, your scenario. It's just that one weird thing. And this is how we calculate from that. Yeah, and, and that happens a lot on projects though, Ian, right? Because a lot of times you spend a lot of money early in the project to buy materials, rent equipment, hire people, and you got a lot of expenditures going out early that don't happen later on in the project. So this is a good one to use, you know, after you've maybe gotten over that initial hump of big spending towards the beginning of the project when things start to level out. Absolutely, absolutely. So that's, and again, this, this is just number two of four, very handy to use when you have some sort of an anomaly. Then you got this next one. This next one's not the one of the one of the most favorites of anybody, right? Because this is probably the hardest to do. And the reason yeah. that it's the hardest to do is because this takes your actual costs and then a bottom-up estimate of everything else you have left to spend. So this says one of two things. Either you are fundamentally flawed in your estimates in the beginning of the project, or you've changed directions in the project and you need to figure out based upon the money that you spent and what you now have left to do with changing directions. What do we need to have? It is absolutely the most accurate way, right? Because if we're bottom up estimating it cost by cost, but it, it is it is it's arduous, it takes a while to do. Um, and it's obviously not something that people really want to shine too big of a, a spotlight on is like, ah, we messed all this stuff up. Right, so this is probably the last one you'd want to ever do because a bottom up estimate is breaking everything on your project down into the very, very detailed cost. It's not, it's not ballparking anything. I mean, you have to do a lot of detailed analysis and estimates of what your resources are going to cost. And, uh, you know, um, there's a lot of work involved. So this is one nobody really wants to do. And the only reason you would do it is, uh, in my opinion anyway, is if you were super over budget and you knew the original budget was blown and you just wanted to get a new number that you could, could start from, right? So then we'll talk about the last one. The last one is slightly different from the rest of them because this is the only one that actually it takes the schedule into account, right? So this one. It looks a little crazy. Rest, it, 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 <laughs> yeah. This one is the one that nobody ever wants to see on the exam, right? Because this is the hardest one to consider, right? You think about it. Estimated completion is the amount of money that I spent so far or my actual cost. Plus now there's a weird calculation. And the thing that's probably the weirdest about it, the thing that a lot of people don't want to want to focus on is this piece right here, right? And one of the best explanations I've ever heard for it, uh, it comes from, from you, Tim. So if you wouldn't mind kind of explaining why we want to multiply costs and schedule performance together. Sure. So if you're trying to figure out how much your project is going to cost, which is the EAC, sometimes the budget and the schedule could or need to be taken into consideration. For example, if you were currently over budget in your project, but you were ahead of schedule, that happens a lot of times, right? If you're, ha if you're able to get ahead of schedule, a lot of times you spent more money in order to get ahead of schedule. And so both of those factors need to be accounted for because yeah, it looks like your project's over budget, but not really because you're ahead of schedule, right? So you take the CPI and the SPI, multiply them together, that accounts for the fact that you might be over budget, but ahead of schedule. You bake that both, both of those factors into that formula and it's gonna uh, help you come up with an accurate estimate at completion for your project. If you thought that the schedule had more weight in your calculation than the budget did, you could, you could figure that in. You can multiply the SPI times maybe 1.2 and it would have 20% more weight in the formula. So it's, it's, it's there, you can tailor that formula to whatever you need to do. So for those of you that are wondering, uh, a lot of people say, hey, you know, after the exam, how do I use these? These are all very real classical examples of exactly how you would use each one of these formulas outside of the exam. On the exam, the one you're probably most likely going to see is that top one up there. That's the one that happens the most uh, often. And in the, those types of scenarios, the, the question will say something along the lines of, we expect the performance to remain the same, or we expect this thing to be consistent, right? That would be that. That's your go-to right there. That's probably your 90% solution. It'll probably answer 90% of the, the possible EVM questions you would get on the exam. So if, that's the, if you can't remember them all, definitely remember that top one, that first one. Awesome. 
So that's that's our that's our spot today on earned value management, baking down into the estimate at completion. Hopefully this helps you a little bit on not just on the exam, but actually being able to use this stuff in real life, right? Because that's what that's what Ask the P and Pros is really all about. And uh, so we appreciate you watching. Ian, you got any parting shots? I appreciate you guys watching. And as Tim said, using these things on a daily basis is more important than three letters behind your name. So there's a lot of power and in, in capability. So I appreciate you guys sticking around and, and wanting to learn. All right, guys. Hey, have a have a good week ahead, and uh, we'll see you in the virtual PMO back with Ask the PM Pros on the next episode. Thanks.